Uh, we're going to start part two. Uh, you know, reading Heidegger can be a bit of a challenge. He has uh, his own idiom, uh, which can be annoying or quite interesting, uh, depending on what you read for, how you uh, how you understand text, printed, uh, written uh, text as a kind of uh, demonstration of thinking, of a kind of idiomatic thinking. Uh, my position on Heidegger's strange writing, uh, what is kind of strange, I suppose, to people who have very narrow margins for what writing should be, um, is that it's Heidegger approaching poetry itself. Um, but I suppose I have to explain a little bit to you what this means. In And I always go back to Baudelaire, but there were other other thinkers, um, poets, firstly, who um, also articulate a similar thing. Coleridge, Baudelaire are two, uh, I think, that are the most uh, significant to um, this moment in continental, uh, so-called continental philosophy, where poetry begins to emerge in the text, and it has a particular idiomatic signature and then it gets completely out of hand with all of the scholarship that goes on afterwards. Um, <laughs> uh, I think Heidegger uh, is a first and foremost a critic in the Baudelarian sense, uh, meaning that uh, I believe he started off uh, in uh, religious uh, study and inquiry uh, and then went to philosophy and in philosophy he approaches poetry. So it would be, um, if you're a theologian or uh, even a saint to some degree, right, you had been critical of, of uh, uh, some kind of absolute, right? You were critical of the, the doxa, of the, the law, of the religion, of dogma. You would have done some type of theological work, the logic of theos or God. Uh, so the approach to the divine is um, more so uh, desire. You're desiring uh, this absolute, at least to understand it. Um, and I think that's true of the strongest critics uh, and philosophers. I'm not saying they don't have a divine inspiration, uh, what would be called divine inspiration. However, I think the problem with philosophers who try to deal with poetry is that they have a hard time dealing with the fact that they're properly a philosopher or a critic. I had mentioned that um, Walter Benjamin is different. Um, I think that uh, he is a most unusual critic in that he is a friend of poetry. You can't say that Heidegger is not, but um, Heidegger is certainly committed to philosophy and what philosophy needs for philosophy to be true, uh, to be to retain its position, uh, the the lover of wisdom and the subjectivity of the philosopher to retain their position. Uh, in human society. So Baudelaire, Baudelaire, and I always talk about this because it's true to me. Baudelaire essentially says that, uh, look, poets are different, and, and this goes with uh, artists. Um, they're different because they had to reason about divine precepts that were given okay that they start out in a way in the opposite um, direction that a critic or philosopher would they start out with the truth uh, and have to reason about it and this is 
what causes what Baudelaire calls a spiritual crisis, which could be uh, considered as a crisis of the mind. Um, crises is such a uh, uh, well trodden. Oh, the artist is having a crisis, you know. Oh, poo poo, right? Oh, poor artist. Um, but it's real. And how the poet, uh, and in many cases, artists, strong artists, strong poets, deal with it um, is what sets them apart from philosophers, properly, critics, properly speaking, writers. Uh, it's not, in the end, it's, in the beginning, let's say, it's not even about the poetry. Right. One becomes a poet by whatever way you name them a poet. Um, but Heidegger is quite on in age. He's he's got about twenty more years to live when he's writing this. When he does his turn, the so-called later Heidegger does his turning. Essentially, what he's trying to do is what Baudelaire calls a monstrosity. He's almost becoming a poet. Right. In his mind. What makes Heidegger's text so interesting is that he gets close to what I would understand and what I've tried to articulate as poetry of thought. And this is evident throughout um, several texts and basic writings. Um, and in particular, when he's defining technic, uh, when he defines technic as a uh, interlocking passages where the revealing reveals to itself. Um, so the revealing reveals to itself and gives itself its own truth through a kind of techne. Um, the question of was there a poesis in there is, is still at large uh, if it has nothing to do with human beings. Um, but th th what Baudelaire says, back to this Baudelaire thing. What Baudelaire says about uh, poets is that they become the best critics, the you know, superior critic. And of course, if you if your mind is open and you are not n narrow in what you believe is legitimate or what you believe is officially sanctioned by institutions, uh, by scholars by canon, by gatekeepers, and you commit to read, and you allow that text, a fair review of, of not even fair, it's, just, it's not even just, it's, uh, you have to approach it with a particular sensitivity, in my opinion, uh, then you can read these texts. And I, I think that that's the commitment and that's the gift of, of study, right? Uh, so you can see, the point is this. Heidegger is, in both the Baudelarian scheme, not a poet. Um, but he's, of course, one of the most amazing philosophers. Why? Because he comes through the power of his reason to the irrational, which is the objective of philosophy, is to achieve and categorize whatever it can, uh, to understand it, Right and apparently for human uh, dignity, the na dignity and nature of human beings. And Heidegger achieves this; he gets really close to it. But what always happens with Heidegger's text is that it ends up being guided toward philosophy, and philosophy is the consequence of poetry. Quite simply, um, poetry. Um, we don't know where it comes from, but you know we can we can say the same thing about cave art or or uh, prehistoric art. Um, but didactic poetry, or the poetry which is sharing knowledge of ways to plow fields, of certain storms that come to certain areas, of certain kings and certain revolts and certain technologies available to societies is given through poetry because of its mnemonic qualities, because one can remember it and tell the story. Walter Benjamin, of course, will tell us that one of the greatest things about uh, the oral tradition was that it would change every time. 
right? So something new would be possibly revealed in the telling, right? Um, revealed uh, by the bringing forth of, in the Heideggerian sense, with the techne, the poesis would bring forth and a new form would emerge and that would be captured by another body, the ones who listen, and then they would carry it on to someone else. Didactic poetry uh, has the, the so-called wisdom of philosophy uh, long before philosophy really becomes a thing. And, and this is the insecurity of philosophy. I think it's the insecurity of Heidegger's philosophy and technology. Technology is a threat um, to philosophy because uh, uh, it can reason. Today, anyway, it has a reasonability, let's say, or it has, uh, uh, it can come to conclusions, right? Can it ask questions, profound questions? You know, you can ask it. You can ask Chat GPT things, and it, it'll summarize. It'll give you uh, ways to read text together. I think it's pretty close, and I think uh, uh, while it's not the perennial uh, philosophy um, and the, the the true sense of the the, the, the philosopher as as can be embodied, uh, I think that it can do philosophy in a way, right? Or what we call philosophy today, how about? So I think the, the diminishment of philosophy and the rise of technic uh, and the majesty of poetry are all things that make Heidegger's uh, desire for poetry quite evident and his reliance um, on Olderlin, the poet. Because if you think about it, if you're Heidegger, who through his his ability to reason and to logic and to to, to have lot to deploy his logic and to think uh, and to, to raise questions through this this great energy he puts forth encounters something like Odalin's poetry and that poetry does something to him it does something to him and it gives him something that his faculty, his mental power, his knowledge, his intelligence, his dedication couldn't provide him the truth or what most likely is the truth. The problem is it comes from the poem. And so Heidegger will attempt to philosophize the poem, which means to bookend what the poem can and cannot do. And that's a disaster for philosophy because if this poem, Olderlin's poem, is what supplies the philosophy with its answers or its way to truth, why would you want to know what it is entirely? How could you ever? Right? I think that's one way to see this. I, I, I realize if you're new to this conversation of poetry and philosophy, uh, it might seem a bit odd. Um, and that there are other people who have different views on it. Um, take which one you want. But I would certainly point out that this is how the question concerning technology ends, about poetry, right? Um, and very much so from Olderlin, uh, because um, after talking about everything poetical and obtaining poesis and techne, I mean, you'll keep going on about it. Um, he will talk about um, poetic revealing, the poetic which thoroughly pervades every art, every revealing of essential unfolding into the beautiful. He will talk about, he will question whether art will be granted, um, uh, what he calls the highest possibility in the midst of extreme danger, of extreme danger, of course, technic. But it's what he thinks saving power is in relation to poetry, uh, which It's very difficult because poems are said to guard or protect. 
To con- the, the poems themselves are what conceal and unconceal. They disclose. Stevens will use this terminology, and he did not and was not in contact with Heidegger, maybe through his uh, French philosopher friends, uh, of which I've done quite a bit of research on, quite sure that that was most likely the case. Uh, but uh, we should be comforted that Wallace Stevens had come to these conclusions in his own intellectual endeavors far sooner. But nonetheless, it does not belong to Stevens either. You could go back to Coleridge and find it in his ideas of, of primary and secondary imagination. So I think if, we're, if, if, if you're a scholar and you're interested in Heidegger and you want to read it, I want you to get this right. What is novel about Heidegger's question, the question concerning technology? Essentially this, that he takes the theory of poetry or what comes from the poetry of thought, right? And he uses it to understand technic, the essence of technology. And he calls it philosophy. And yes, he says where he gets these ideas from Oldelin. But the problem is, is that it's a bit inauthentic for me, right? But I, I understand it. It's always just kind of bothered me. Let me give you an example, because where we left off last, um, it's actually a type of definition of technic, a kind of vision of technic. Um, page 322. Okay, at this point, he's already talked about a techno science that somehow uh, modern, ex, uh, modern technology puts exact science to use. He asks of what essence that is, right? He talks about uh, the revealing that holds sway throughout modern technology, uh, d- does not un- unfold into a bringing forth in the sense of poesis. He's going through and developing things that he mentions Oldelin on the next page. And then he comes to this strange thing about, about challenging. Right. Such challenging happens in that the energy concealed in nature is unlocked and what is unlocked is transformed and what is transformed is stored up and what is stored up is in turn distributed and what is distributed is switched about ever anew. So he's talking about this series of of uh, transformation, right? The challenging, the terraforming or the 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 the. the destruction almost uh, of the earth, its atmosphere, its, its ground, bringing all this energy in, unlocking, transforming, storing, distributing, and switching about. These are all ways of revealing, but revealing what? He says, but revealing never simply comes to an end. That's interesting because if revealing never comes to an end, I guess the question is, wh- what of revealing is appearing to us in the phenomenological sense, right? It revealing can seem to come to an end, uh, but of course it's continuing on. Um, but this does not uh, the 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 appearance can be revealed, but revealing also now I think has a significance in terms of feeling. Uh, at least that's how I would read it. Feeling before is feeling a phenomenon. Is a feeling an appearance, right? What what actually is an appearance? Um, do would all appearances have some nudge or notion of a feeling prior to? Because the appearance anyway is just a delay, an analog delay, you could say, right? So how much of that appearance is actually felt? and more quickly than the appearance that one then thinks about in consciousness and reflection. Um, the, 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 poet, uh, the poet has a different approach here. Uh, and I think this is important to, to consider uh, that revealing reveals to itself could actually be the poet who um, the poetry of the subject or the true subject of poetry. So in Stevens' theory in the poetry of thought, 
what happens? You just, I'm just going to make this poetry. If you want to call it, I'm just going to write this down. I'm just going to make this. I'm going to paint this. I'm going to do this. It's not even saying that. It's just do it. You don't hesitate, right? Hesitation is not an option. You just do it. But you know, you, you, you feel. You know before you know what it is. You, you, you don't intend, you don't seek, you don't desire the truth. You don't care <laughs> if, you've, if you've read a lot of things and you know a lot of things or you, you're, you're envisioning things you, you, you have never thought about before, whatever, it's there. So that's the true subject of poetry. We just follow it. Um, but first we do it and don't hesitate. The poetry of the subject is a different matter. So let's set that aside for a moment. The true subject, if I write the poems, if I do the things, let's say I'm a really good, I'm really good with my technique of writing, right? And there's a poesis in it. Um, and let's say I'm doing it by the true subject. It reveals to me after, right? The revealing reveals to itself. The itself was me because it comes from me. It's put down its own system of disclosures, its own network of disclosures. The revealing reveals to itself is, is one way of saying, revealing to, to myself or the poem revealing to itself, right? Because the poet, the, the poet, the poet, the poet does not have to, uh, uh, care about what exactly they're saying. They know without knowing and they do without hesitation. And upon a review, perhaps you have multiple poems or multiple things you've created or there's some building somewhere that you wrote about and you didn't even, you've never been there before kind of thing, these kind of weird, uncanny situations you might be in. That is uh, the poetry um, that is of the true subject. If it happens to be about a bunch of cats, then it does. But if you want to just write about cats, that's the poetry of the subject and usually quite sentimental or boring or, you know, why most people who want to be poets, who actually want to be poets, right? Good luck. Um, <laughs> but the people who want to be poets, right, give up. Because they're desiring something because they they don't have it. They're a critic, and that's okay, right? These these this is not like you have to be a poet or die, um, kind of thing. So when I read this on three twenty two, right, the revealing reveals to itself its own manifoldly interlocking paths through regulating their course. It, to me, it seems like two things: disclosure according to the true subject of poetry. Um, when the poet looks upon their works and sees something is revealed or as Stevens would say disclosed or I see that technic has the logic of poetry a poetry of thought right um, because the poetry of thought is not just a collection of philosophemes as uh, some critics might say it is something that we perhaps so-called writers actually can't read uh, uh, yet. We, it's not legible to us. Um, Benjamin would definitely see this, uh, would definitely agree with this, uh, I, I believe. What accedes to legibility, I think is how we put it. So, when Heidegger is describing technic, Also, you can see it has been described as the poetry of thought. And it's not a game. Because when Heidegger is talking about the revealing reveals to itself in its own manifoldly interlocking paths through regulating their course, it sounds like neural networks to me. It sounds like something working off of, of large language models or data sets and training the 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 AI right 
And as it gains in sophistication, it begins to reveal to itself, right? It has its own, it's approaching its true subject. And it's not human. And I think this is why there's a fatality in it, right? Uh, there's a danger. Uh, but when Heidegger is talking about the standing reserve, right? Uh, the, the human that's for human beings as he will that gets a bit strange because do we really need to get that far <laughs> you know is that even possible at that point uh, and there's a lot of philosophers who have tried or there's some good ones that have tried to think about this uh, some are my teachers and uh, just coming to their conclusions and certain not entirely but seeing these aspects and different readings of Heidegger's text and Technic uh, it's it's quite a pleasure to you know go through this same neighborhood but uh, I wonder this regulating itself is for its part everywhere secured regulating what is being regulating hmm what is being regulated regulating and securing even becoming the chief characteristics of the revealing that challenges and what is it challenging right what kind of unconcealment uh it is then that is particular to that which results from the setting upon that challenges challenges earth right it's supposed to be for us that's what heidegger is going to tell us Everywhere, everything is ordered to stand by to be immediately on hand. He's making the example to an airplane. He goes on, 323. Um, only to the extent that man, for his part, is already challenged to exploit the energies of nature. Can this revealing that orders happen? If man is challenged, ordered to do this, then does not man himself belong even more originally than nature within the standing reserve? I just, this one's a tough one, man. I, I just, is there really an estrangement that Heidegger has with nature? Is it really so? He gives more examples um, of, of what he's trying to talk about. Um, he says man is, is more challenged originally than are the energies of nature into the process of ordering. I don't know about this, right? He has never transformed into mere standing reserve. I also don't know about that. I really don't know about if that's true today. Maybe in Heidegger's time it was. Since man drives technology forward, he takes part in ordering as a way of revealing. But the unconcealment itself within uh, which ordering unfolds is never a human handiwork. Any more than is the realm man traverses every time he has a subject he as a subject relates to an object. Hmm. The unconcealment itself is never a human handiwork. But you would not have unconcealment if you did not have something at which brings that about, right? Every techne has to have some kind of unconcealment, right? Because when you have this Techne and you have this bringing forth is brought forth by what for Heidegger, you know, something is being unconcealed uh, uh, You know in revealed because you're bringing it into the world. I don't know When man in his way from within unconcealment reveals that which presence is he merely responds to the call of unconcealment, even when he contradicts it. Thus, when man, investing, observing, pushes nature as an area of his own conceiving, he has already been claimed by a way of revealing that challenges him to approach nature as an object of research, until even the object disappears into the objectlessness of standing reserve. Hmm. So here Heidegger is talking about desiring nature as an area of his own conceiving. But in, 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 the, in the poetry of thought, he, he does not have to desire this. Right? 
Because Heidegger says he's already been claimed by a way of revealing that challenges him to approach nature as an object of research, right? This is what he desires. Funny. And when Heidegger's talking this way, he's, he's pretty lucid. He's not getting a bit, uh, he's not too idiomatic here. When Heidegger talks about desiring the object on page 324. The objectlessness of standing reserve. Again, I think, I think when we consider what becomes a form, uh, it is preceded by a formlessness. And I cannot help but think Heidegger's idea here of formlessness, of the absolute, um, is transcribed into a standing reserve, which is objectlessness, which disappears into the standing reserve, which is a kind of work by technology, right? He still wants us to be the hero of all of this, right? I mean, he, human beings, we're driving technology forward and we're taking part in ordering as a way of revealing, right? We're revealing, so we're creating the standing reserve. I just don't buy it. So maybe I'm reading it wrong, right? Because he calls it danger. You'll call it danger. But he sees that the power of poetic uh, the art, and art and, and this kind of thinking that goes on there can direct it. Sounds good to me. But on the, on the, on the flip side of this, I don't know. I, I really think the formlessness here uh, is just rewritten into a kind of technique. Uh, I don't see the novelty here. Uh, and maybe that's that's the problem. Maybe I think more in a Heide Heideggerian way than I ever thought. I'm willing to be surprised. I'm willing to keep reading. Modern technology as a revealing that orders is thus no mere human doing. Therefore, we must take the challenge that sets upon man to order the actual as standing reserve in accordance with the way it shows itself. That challenging gathers man into ordering this gathering concentrates man upon ordering the actual as standing reserve. Okay, now it's getting a bit strange. So I guess we're going to use modern technology as a revealing that orders is that that is no mere human doing. Therefore, we must take the challenge that sets upon man to, to order the actual standing reserve in accordance with the way it shows itself. The challenging gathers man into ordering. Okay. The challenging of technique, right? Digging earth apart gathers us into ordering. Okay. All right. It's a kind of event, right? It's a kind of seismic thing. It's gathering and gaining uh, uh, us because it's gaining this kind of nature it's pushing us into a particular ways this gathering concentrates man upon ordering the actual as standing reserve the actual huh things of the world that we think are actual uh they're not it's not perhaps reality it's the actual right you know the difference between what is actual and what is re the real so it does have complications for reality but it's actual so it's not entirely real here interesting so it's a kind of of yeah it's a type of ordering of illusion right the gathering concentrates man upon ordering the actual as standing reserve hmm.